Hi, my name is Kimberly McQuarrie, and I am the co-director of the Innovation Labs and the director of programming here at the Delhi Museum. We're happy to have you join us today for our bi-monthly video podcast, Follow the Tangent, Art, Archives, and Anecdotes, where we go behind the scenes in art history and think about the life behind the works, especially those that connect with our in-house archives. Today, we are joined by a very special guest, um, Miguel Escribano, who is our fall research fellow here at the Dali Museum. And he's going to share with us a little bit about his research fellowship um, and what he is hoping to find and hoping to use um, our archives for. So happy to have you here, Miguel. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Kim. Happy to be here. Excellent. So why I would bet that a lot of our viewers um, even people who are longtime members or have been to the museums multiple times, they don't know a lot about our archives and um, they probably are not familiar with our fellowship program. So could you share a little bit about the program, what its purpose is and what its intended outcomes um, are? Yeah, the, the fellowship is a chance for researchers to, to spend some time delving into the archives, focus on the archives and see what they can turn up. Obviously with a, an idea of what they're looking for. Um, but the, the fun of it is seeing what turns up. Yeah, so. that's, always, that's always the fun part. Um, so I, before we kind of get into, uh, before we kind of get into what you were hoping to find and what you thought about when you were applying for this fellowship, why don't you, you know, share a little bit um, about yourself and, you know, what your background is, how did you get interested in um, doing this archival research in the area of art and art history? Yeah. Um, I'm English. I grew up in England with a Spanish father. He had studied art uh, in Sevilla when he was growing up. And um, amongst the artists he liked was Dali. And we had a poster of the, um, it's got several titles, but the outskirts on, of the paranoia critical town. Mm -hmm. uh, in the outskirts of suburbia of European history or title something like that but it's um one of Dali's works where uh it relies a lot on his visual puns and double images mm -hmm. so growing up with that on the living room wall I I know every inch of it and that really drew me in and caught my attention mm -hmm. a little later I when I was a teenager, I covered one bedroom wall with posters of uh, Dali paintings. Um, and I started collecting books. I was always fascinated by Dali. Um, and when I was 17, traveling down to Spain from England one time just to visit relatives, I took a detour via Figueres mm -hmm. and uh, these were the days when information wasn't as readily available. So I'd read much earlier accounts or several years earlier of people just popping in and his house being open and you could visit him. But by then, this is 1984, the year before the fire, Gala had died and he was at Pubol. Um, but I was curious to see if it was possible to visit. So I went to Pubol and knocked on the door. Um, didn't get to meet him, he was inside, but uh, spoke to Anthony Pichot. Mm -hmm. uh, then carried on down to my relatives in Sevilla. Um, but uh, I'd always got that interest in Dali. And then um, a few years later, I did live in Spain for a while, moved back to England and I was working in uh, the, the main art galleries there. I worked at the Royal Academy and the Hayward and the Tate, and then at the National Gallery for a few years. 
Um, and I came into that quite accidentally, but I was working front of house, mm -hmm. and but was familiar with all the other departments. And that's when it really started eating at me that I should be studying more in depth. Mm -hmm. And uh, looked up and saw that Dawn Addis was teaching in Essex, which was my side of London where I was living. So I, I started, um, I could commute up and go to classes. So I started uh, going to Dawn Addis's classes uh, while I was in London working at in the university and then there was no looking back so I did my master's and my PhD um, but now these days I'm in Sweden so I'm a bit out of the loop here mm. but uh, obviously I'd like to do more with the with my studies so far so they, I, I found out about the fellowship just by chance. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what I was Googling, but it came up. Um, and I applied for it. But that was two years ago that I applied for last year, which was cancelled because of the pandemic. And um, this year it was also touch and go. The Dalim decided to go ahead with it without really knowing whether it was going to be possible and uh, as it turns out, the things are opening up and I'm um, doing it. Yeah, I mean, those are pretty uh, incredible. I, so obviously not a lot of people can say that they knocked on Dali's door. <laughs> so I think that's a great, I think that's a great story, even if you didn't get to, um, even if you didn't get to meet him. I think always put yourself out there, you know, that's how you get things in life. Uh, I love the attitude. Now, you mentioned that you're in Sweden now, and obviously, you know, Delhi is associated with many places with, um, you know, Figueres in Spain or Cadaqués or Paris, of course, or even, you know, he lived in um, New York for, you know, part of the year, many years and went to Hollywood. But Sweden is not a place we normally associate with Delhi. Um, so what is the current situation with your research? What kinds of materials do you have access to there? Um, to help you? Um, we have, there is one important Dali at the uh, Moderna Museet, um, William Tell, mm -hmm. with a huge painting. Um, but otherwise, no, there's, uh, besides what's available online, I have my own library, you can see some of it behind me, Mm -hmm. So I have my own collection of books and other material, which I've collected. I can show you some of them. I've taken, taken out some of the ones that uh, are most relevant to yourselves. So I'll just say that um, while I was working at the National Gallery in London, there are some fantastic secondhand bookshops mm -hmm. nearby. So I'd go on every break and after work and built up my my library mainly there so here's one you might recognize mm -hmm. definitely yeah another one very cool oh so these are books for people who don't recognize them by a reynolds morse and eleanor and produced by the dali museum mm -hmm. Here's a nice one. Oh, cool. Uh, and another thing I had um, the opportunity to start collecting while I was there in London um, were the Gowans books, which was a collection of art books that Dali had as a child. Um, and that were very important. When I started my master's, I was interested to see and read about the collection. Um, Ian Gibson uh, wrote about them, detailed which books were there, but didn't really say much about them. So I was curious um, and found a few at the British Museum. And then that was enough to maybe think there was there was 
important things to be discovered there. So here's one of them on the collection. A little book. I'll put it next to my head for reference. <laughs> Tiny books with small black and white illustrations. Now, this was Dali's introduction to painting. So I think this played a part in, in um, his early aesthetic of the hand-painted painted, uh, color photography of dreams. So mm -hmm. here's one and you really, it draws you in to see mm -hmm. the details. And then there's more and more that you recognize from his paintings. Mm -hmm. Small details. That's uh, one on the early Flemish painters. There's another one with Vermeer. And if we can see the main picture on the cover. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are certain paintings here which were embedded in his subconscious or, well, his conscious. Yeah, he was quite the lover of Vermeer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's very cool. I've always wondered that myself. Um, you always hear that he got his introduction to art through these Gowans volumes, but because they're not easy to find, um, I've not had the opportunity to look into them and see what was it that he was looking at? What was it that, you know, so affected him? Very uh, cool. There's a lot more there. There's too much for us to discuss in depth now, but there, there's a lot there there. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to come back and maybe we can do uh, maybe we can do an episode about the gallons. But um, to focus on the project that you're hoping to do here in archive our archives, um, mm -hmm. you know what is the plan? Um, how do you hope to use our archives? What are you hoping to find? What would be the kind of great awesome thing that you would find that you'd be like, yes, this is what I was looking for all along. Yeah. This is my big yeah. win. Well. The Part of the point of the fellowship was to be there in Florida and just go through and see what I could come up with. But luckily you've given me access to the digital archives online. So I'm doing that at the moment, just going through everything that's available and seeing what comes up. But obviously with an idea and that at the end of the fellowship, I will produce um, a piece of writing for the Dali Museum. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've got to be forming that idea as I dig things up. But um, it will be continuing the line that I've been following so far in my research, which is the importance of these old paintings, but especially religious art. And I don't mean just the later period of Dali, but all through his surrealist period. There are well, we've seen um, the Vermeer, mm -hmm. uh, which is present throughout his um, surrealism, but there are lo lots of other details from quite particular areas of religious art that had a meaning that he used to convey the psychoanalytical mm -hmm. aspects of his art that, uh, that he was doing through the surrealist period. Um, so. I will be continuing that line of looking for the influence of religious art. But I think with the, the Dali archives, really I'm looking for this transition from around the time he met A. Reynolds Morse, mm -hmm. 1943, and just before that, 1940, when he came to the United States, and it took a while for him to develop this idea of nuclear mysticism. Mm -hmm. But it's, for me, what's new in his nuclear mysticism is the idea of the nuclear mm -hmm. cutting edge. But I'm still going for the mysticism. I'm still after uh, why the, he retained the religious aspect of um, of, the, of this scientific concept that he was looking for. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I think that it pushes against something that always has felt a little bit too cut and dried for me or too easy. And that is that that later part of his career is a return to religion. 
And this is a suggestion that no, this is something that has been present in his work all along, maybe just not in the form that you might easily recognize it. Uh, to give an idea, in my PhD thesis, I thought of the, the three periods of his life, if you think of the pre-surrealist years, mm -hmm. from 1926 through to 1929, um, centered around the figure of San Sebastian, Saint Sebastian. There, it was the idea of a religious concept of the body. So it was the self as a physical body. Then through surrealism, his surrealist period, the images that he was using from religious art were the idea of the self as a thinking person, as a mental self. And then there's the transition into the later period towards um, transcendence, towards the mystical and uh, the, the series of paintings with heading towards the ascension mm -hmm. to heaven. And then that, when you look at it that way, you see the continuation throughout his career. Yeah, very it's cool. a natural progression as well. The aesthetic changes abruptly those two times, sort of mm -hmm. give a false idea of... Uh, of distinct periods. Mm -hmm. When it's really just a kind of transformation um, yeah. or a permutation of the same thing, but in just slightly different nuance. Yeah. So th this period through the 1940s in um, the USA, that's, that's the area that I'm looking at and hoping that there will be um, something more of interest in the uh, archives mm -hmm. that um, hopefully someone hasn't picked up on yet in that, in that uh, context. Now you mentioned, I mean, obviously right now I'm talking to you um, from your home base in Sweden instead of here where you know, I know that you would like to be. Um, you mentioned digital archives. Could you share a little bit about how you maybe have had to reconceive either the project or your methodology in terms of having your fellowship move from being live to virtual? Yeah. Um, as you're aware, it was a long process trying to get there and I was aiming to be there. And so I was looking forward to just going to the archives with an open mind mm -hmm. um, without any preconceived idea of what they would look like, what I'd find. But instead, once we've um, readjusted and seen that I'll be doing this virtually, I've uh, been delving into the digital archives and luckily they're fantastically indexed and structured so I can be much more methodological than I was um, thinking mm -hmm. I would be. So I'm just going through the archives in order. So hopefully that um, has its positive aspects too. Mm -hmm. that, uh, amount of structure rather than just arriving there in the archives surrounded by boxes and wondering where to start. So I've, um, as you say, I've reconceived the idea of the research but it's uh, it's not necessarily worse mm -hmm. there are positive aspects to it one thing i will miss is being able to go and look at the paintings and just stand in front of a painting and thinking but obviously images are available too but there's uh, there's there's something you miss about being in the presence of the painting, the details. Yeah, that's really interesting, um, the point about standing in front of the painting, because um, I've read a couple of articles that although there was a boom right at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of people searching for virtual museum experiences, that very quickly waned. Um, and uh, I have had a few virtual um, tour requests, but certainly nothing like 
the in-person visitation um, that we have enjoyed. And I, I think a lot of people probably share that, that it's not the same to see or experience a painting through the screen as amazing as technology is. Um, you know, that's why you could, you could see the Mona Lisa all day long. Um, and yet people crowd into that room um, to stand shoulder yeah. to shoulder <laughs> to yeah. see it. No, I've, I've, only, I've only seen it at the Louvre across the sea of heads. And uh, I gave up <laughs> on that experience. Um, I was going to say, you know, uh, besides um, seeing the paintings, another uh, advantage of being at the at the Dali, if I'd been there in person, I was hoping to be involved in a lot more events there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see how that goes. But to move on to another point, um, hopefully I will be able to come in December, but I'm saying hopefully because I've been trying for months now to arrange this. Uh, and all we know at the moment is that travel restrictions should be taken away on the 8th of November. We'll see. And then I'll have to start the process of applying for an ESTA, which should be straightforward in normal circumstances, but my experience over the last few months tells me it's not going to be that straightforward. Well, that was, uh, I, I, I was going to ask you about that. And I'm glad you've shared that because I'm sure people are wondering, uh, we've all heard these rumors and everything is obviously constantly shifting, um, but I'm glad to hear that it's still in the works. So um, we would love to have you here in person and then we could probably do a in-person follow-up on the Gowans volumes. That would be exciting. So I'll keep my fingers crossed. Uh, the, the flight's booked, the accommodation is booked, but we'll see. Okay. Well, we'll send up a prayer to St. Sebastian um, yeah. that, he <laughs> that he look favorably on your endeavor. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to thank you for um, joining me today for this conversation. It was interesting to hear about what you're hoping to find, and I'm super excited about it and hope that I do get to meet you in person. Yep. Same here. Looking forward to coming. Awesome. Well, thank you. 4th of December, it'll be as soon as possible. I will be there. Yes. Knocking on your door. I, I, will, I will call out to everyone to manifest that um, possibility for us. And to our viewers who are watching, be sure to catch our next episode um, where we're going to resume our talk with assistant curator Allison McCarthy on how an exhibition comes to life. Part two, where we'll be talking about um, the creative design of the exhibit. Until then, thanks for joining us for Follow the Tangent. Bye.